with you. Today, we're going to be looking at planning for a holistic cybersecurity approach in 24, um, conveying organization wide importance of cybersecurity, preparing for potential regulations, and assessing cybersecurity maturity and uncovering gaps. So, I've got a couple of questions I'd like for you to consider. <clears throat> and if you would, maybe write down your answers. We're going to revisit these later in the presentation. And the first uh, question is, does your organization have a holistic cybersecurity approach? You can answer this, yes or no. Um, just, do you feel like you've got a holistic cybersecurity approach? The next question is, are you aware of any current state regulations or federal guidelines regarding cybersecurity and privacy that may impact your organization? The next question is, currently in your organization, who is responsible for cybersecurity? What department or maybe even what personnel if it's not a department? And the last question is, do you have any gaps in your cybersecurity uh, program now? And how confident are you that there are no gaps or are gaps in your program? So first we're gonna talk about holistic cybersecurity and the importance of an organization-wide cybersecurity uh, program. So a holistic cybersecurity strategy, if we look at and, and wanna define what holistic cybersecurity is, it's really looking at cybersecurity as it encompasses all aspects of your security program. And it historically, we've really looked at protecting data. HIPAA was about protecting data. A lot of regulation and things that we've been doing are to protect the data. And I wanna emphasize that we really need to think about and start planning to protect the patients. We've already seen some cases where the ransomware or the system was unavailable and it impacted patients. So we've gotta take that into consideration as we're planning our cybersecurity strategy. And a holistic cybersecurity strategy is gonna integrate with different security measures, technical solutions, policies, training, and it's really gonna create a comprehensive defense mechanism across your organization. Now, this is not an all-inclusive list, but some key components of a holistic strategy are gonna be things like identity and access management, data protection, network security and endpoint security. Now, the next one, medical device and IoT security, often is outside of IT. And we really have to focus and, and keep that in our holistic strategy that we protect medical device and IoT security. A lot of times, in my experience, you find that medical devices fall to a biomedical department and the biomedical department reports to your facilities department. We really need to start thinking about is that the appropriate place for that department to uh, report to? Or would that be better uh, reporting to an information technology department or even a security department that can help protect those assets, especially when we think about protecting our patients? Next, we have employee training, physical security, incident response plans, and even compliance. So as we talk about a holistic cyber security strategy, we're really looking at it outside of the IT department, how it affects the organization, anything from clinical staff to administrative workers, and even down to the patients. And we're gonna talk about how patients can be involved a little later in the presentation, but it's really about creating a culture of security awareness and shared responsibility holistically across the whole organization. Now, why is cybersecurity, why is it outside of IT? Why am I saying that? Well, this first case we have is, it actually happened at University Health Network, and it was a ransomware attack in October of 2020 that caused $21 million in damages. Now, that's bad enough, but if we look on the right-hand side, this is the timeline of that cyber attack. And you can see that the attack happened on October the 28th. And the organization switched to paper EMAR and then even established on day seven an outpatient infusion command center. On day 12, they had a new inpatient command center established. Read-only access to the EMR was established on day 14. So the organization went 25 days without access to an EMR, 28 days without any contact through email. 
And even worse, the radiology systems and images were not restored until day 40. So as you see, this is well outside of the ID department. This impacts the whole organization. This is impacting anything, like we say, from the clinical team all the way to administrative. And when you look at the outpatient infusion command center and, and these other things that they did along the way, a holistic cybersecurity approach is gonna have you better prepared and it's gonna have you ready to implement those things sooner. And that goes into your incident response plan. Now, we'll take a look at a second example. This is actually where cyber criminals have used social engineering um, or reached out to patients um, or staff to try to influence the hospital to pay a ransom. I heard in one case that they were offering uh, uh, victims of a cyber breach, the patients, to pay a $50 fee to uh, remove their data from the data that was gonna be put on the web, dark web. So this is how the patients can be involved. Um, and when we look at a holistic cybersecurity approach, we have to look at how our clinical teams are gonna respond. We have to look even to how our teams are gonna respond when they're out at a local um, grocery store and they get confronted by someone who's been called by an attacker. What is their response? And that's what a holistic cybersecurity approach is, is making sure that you are addressing some of these things that are gonna happen from an organization standpoint rather than an IT standpoint. Now, some of the trends that we are seeing um, are prioritizing patient safety. So like we talked about, um, there are actually have been cases, and what would your team do if you had a cath lab and the cath lab got hit with ransomware? How would you respond? And then when we talk about involving clinical teams, we know that we train for phishing and things like that, but in my experience, when we do clinical tabletop, or when we do tabletops, usually it's to check and see if we have an incident response plan, or we may check business continuity but we really need to shift those clinical those tabletops to clinical tabletops our organization recently did a tabletop that involved over 200 individuals from a hospital a really large tabletop that had multiple different systems being impacted and looking at how everyone would respond so shifting to a clinical tabletop and moving that to an organization event rather than a department event separation of IT security and elevation of uh, the CISO role. The next slide is gonna talk about that a little bit more, so we'll dig into that. And then continued reliance on maturity models versus formal assessments. Now, in part one of the series, if you didn't get an opportunity to view that, it was recorded, so you can get access to that, and I encourage you to do so. And we, we introduced the topic of maturity models. We're gonna dig into that. Um, later in this presentation, we're going to look at maturity models and how that looks ag against uh, formal assessments. So I said in, in part one of this, we talked about uh, moving the CISO or vCISO role outside of IT. Now on the left-hand side, this is a org chart. Now this is a general chart. Your organization may be a little different, especially if you're smaller. You may not have a CIO. You might not have a COO. You're, you may have an, a department leader for IT that reports directly to the CEO or CFO is common. But generally, it's going to look something like this. And then your cybersecurity is usually handled by someone in the green in the very bottom. Now, on the right-hand side, this is representing the trend that we're seeing where the CISO is moved outside of the IT department. And you can see here that the CISO or the vCISO is actually reporting to the COO. Again, you may not have a COO. You may be too small for a uh, CISO. Hopefully, you're looking at having a virtual CISO through, through a partner. Um, but you may just have a cyber analyst that reports directly to a COO or CEO or even CFO. The point is, is that person is outside of the IT department. And the reason we're seeing that, ISACA actually teaches this as part of the CISM program, is that if your cybersecurity is underneath your IT department leader, it's really conflicting roles. Your, your IT department or your CIO is trying to have business continuity, availability, systems to be efficient and work well. Cybersecurity doesn't always fit with that. Sometimes implementing 
things like MFA create challenges or make there more, be more clicks. And the point of moving that role outside of the IT department is take that responsibility away from that IT leader who is being pulled in different directions, who is having to worry about cybersecurity, but also keeping users efficient. And moving that to the CFO or COO or even the CEO allows someone with a business mindset to make the decisions on what security controls are going to be implemented. So that's a trend we are seeing. Now, what are some strategies to achieve that holistic cybersecurity strategy that we're talking about? We talked about tabletop si simulations. And if your organization is doing or not doing tabletop sim simulations, I encourage you to look for vendors that are healthcare specific, because that matters. Organizations that have experience in healthcare and understand things like your cath lab and your radiology program and all of these aspects of your hospital are gonna be much better at helping you do tabletop simulations that can impact that. Maturity modeling. Now, again, we're gonna talk about maturity modeling later on, uh, but maturity modeling helps you identify your gaps. It lets you uh, determine what your current state is and looking at what your future state is gonna be. And then security awareness. We need to expand participation and training. And I'm not talking about the annual training that we do. We need to move that to more frequent training. It needs to be short little blurbs and in, in much more frequent uh, to improve cybersecurity awareness, but also involving uh, some of your department leaders or some of your senior leaders in programs like Cloudway's Cybersecurity Insider Program. And Laura's gonna uh, have some information on that later, but that's a way that you can uh, increase your security awareness. Now, I was a CIO in a hospital, worked in a rural hospital for 20 years. I was a CIO uh, for the last seven of those years. And I know that during the day, I was going to meetings and doing administrative work. And at night, I was doing engineering and, and implementations. It didn't leave very much time for security awareness. But uh, now that I see what goes into these programs and getting that information to you in a concise and, and, and quick manner, this is really a force multiplier you can use to take, take the time and, and go through those programs because it's really going to get you a lot of information that you otherwise wouldn't have. And collaborate. Partner with your peers. Uh, we don't do a very good job of that in healthcare, but also utilizing consultants. One of the things I see in um, IT departments is, I'm not really sure if it's a, a fear of, um, you know, someone coming in and identifying some systems are not up to par, or if there's just a fear of job security, but I see a reluctance to work with outside expertise. And there are some people out there that truly want to help organizations improve their cybersecurity. And that's their goal, is just to help. So one of the ways is, maybe some contract hours with a VCSO or some other program that's going to help you with an outside perspective. Now we're going to take a look at uh, some federal cybersecurity guidelines and even some state cybersecurity regulations. Now, HHS has uh, developed some goals and these goals are known as the HPH cybersecurity performance goals. And there's really two sets to these goals. These are essential goals and then there's enhanced goals. Now, these are voluntary goals. You don't have to meet these, uh, but we're gonna take a look real quick at the essential goals. And a lot of these things really are things that hospitals already should be doing. When you look at mitigating vulnerabilities or multi-factor authentication or separate user privilege versus um, privileged accounts, if your IT group is logging in with accounts that they use as admin accounts, you really need to change that. Your IT group should have a login account, and anytime they want to do any work, they should have a privileged account. And they should have to escalate their privilege through a privilege access manager some other way. Now, vendor and supplier cybersecurity requirements. This is a difficult one, but these are in the essential goals. Now we're going to take a look at the enhanced goals. These are things like asset inventory. They're a pretty difficult thing to keep track of if you've got a lot of devices. You've got third party vulnerability disclosures and incident reporting, and how you detect and respond to threats. And even your configuration management at the bottom. And, and this is really talking about baselines, right? Do you have baselines for your servers or for your systems? Now, the 
maturity modeling, and, and we're going to look at a specific maturity model later, um, and this is the maturity levels that are used in the one we're going to look later, and you've got anything from not implemented to fully implemented. So there's really four classifications of how your cybersecurity is being measured. Now, in the first part of this series, I, I talked to you about the cybersecurity insurance top 12, the things they're looking for, and they set premiums based off of. And while the HPH uh, goals are really voluntary, this is a crosswalk of how some of these goals are matched to what the insurance is looking for. So if you look on the left side, it, side anything that has a blue line is crosswalk in some way to some of the cybersecurity top 12 considerations. Now on the right hand side, these are your enhanced goals. And I've said that your essential goals are really things that we already should be doing, but look at how many of the enhanced goals are over there. Do you have centralized log collection, maybe a seam or, or something of that nature? And do you have baselines? And uh, are you testing your cybersecurity? Are you doing penetration tests? So the future of HPH goals, now I wanna be very clear that they're voluntary goals, but there is some opinion that they could be tied to CMS reimbursement later and even uh, tied to JCO audits. But as I've shown you, the cyber insurance premiums are really kind of tied to these goals already. They're in alignment. And you're gonna see that in the regulations and in different frameworks and, and uh, goals that are out there is there's a lot of alignment in these. When we go back to looking at HIPAA, HIPAA was really for patient privacy. And while some of these things were in HIPAA, mainly uh, encryption, uh, and data in transit and at rest, and user logins being, um, I, you know, identity access management, really a lot of these regulations are, are uh, in alignment. And then legal liability. So if you're not meeting what the HPH has said as a basic requirement, and someone is in a data breach, you could find yourself in a very vulnerable position trying to argue why you are not meeting what HPH says is a basic requirement. Now, looking at what New York has um, out there, um, I could not find anything that said that this has gone um, live yet. Laura may correct me, she may have some information on that, but they are real, really leading state initiative to regulate cybersecurity in healthcare specifically. And five um, points from the regulation that they've got out there, uh, it, it was in November of 23, it was introduced and it, it had a 60 day um, comment period. Uh, we should be beyond that. But in there, there were five bullets and they cover risk assessments and cybersecurity program requirements cybersecurity policies, chief information security and reporting requirements, audit trails and records maintenance, and incident response plan and department reporting. So the first uh, part, the risk assessments and cybersecurity program had some minimum things that the security policy must address. Those are things like identifying internal and external cybersecurity or uh, making sure you have a defense of infrastructure and policies and procedures in place. Can you detect, respond, and recover to cybersecurity events? But there are also some uh, additional things that policy should address, and those are, this one's new, in-house developed applications must follow de secure development procedures. That's a difficult one. Procedures are in place to assess the security of externally developed applications. So applications you get from third-party vendors have to be secured through uh, some kind of secure design, access privileges, and then uh, data destruction. Now, in the last point here, it says that security measures and controls are implemented to protect non-public information. And I wanna emphasize non-public. This is the first time we're seeing non-public information that I'm aware of and in any kind of regulation for cybersecurity. And what this means is what we've been protecting all along, this EPHI, we're going beyond that. And organizations are, especially in New York, when this goes into place, are gonna to have to possibly retool and, and rework some of their cybersecurity to include additional systems that weren't ever protected. 
And then cybersecurity policies, again, you see that reference to non-public information. And then a CISO must recommend uh, cybersecurity policy to the governing board. So they, there is a requirement that a CISO or a VCSO or something of that nature um, is, is in place. And then policies and procedures have to be based on a risk assessment. Now you can use a maturity model and you see all the different policies there that they have in the regulation. Now, chief information security reporting requirements. And again, hospitals have to designate a qualified senior or executive level staff member to serve as a CISO. So yeah, they are regulating there has to be some CISO. You can also use um, third-party contract. They did allow uh, for virtual CISOs and things of that. Um, so the CISO has to report to the governing body these, these items below, things like integrity of the systems or policies and procedures, or even material cybersecurity risk or the effectiveness of the cybersecurity program. Incident response plan. Now, this is really nothing new. Uh, we all we were doing a lot of cases incident response plans, um, but you got to have personnel and their roles and responsibilities in that incident response plan. Communication and information sharing, remediation and risks. Um, but at the bottom here, internal processes for responding to cyber events. So that has to be in the incident response policy as well. Audit trails and records maintenance. So the New York regulation specifies that any information system design, security, or maintenance documentation be retained for six years. And any audit trails or logs that's used to detect and respond to cybersecurity events have to be maintained for six years. On the last point, identified material risk. Material is in quotes because material is not well defined but there has to be remedial plans and efforts documented for six years. So in summary, um, what we're seeing in the New York uh, cybersecurity regulation for healthcare is that it's gonna exi supplement existing requirements and it's likely gonna present challenges to smaller or rural hospitals, especially those that aren't prepared for change and, and have to um, possibly go through a considerable changes to policies and procedures. While that New York regulation is, you know, it's probably not gonna impact most of us, um, but um, we need to be aware. Um, we gotta stay aware of HPH. So some things that you can do to prepare for regulations that may be coming to your state is we gotta, we gotta stay aware and we gotta, um, be aware of the initiatives. And again, a program like Cloudways Cybersecurity Insider Program is an excellent way um, to know what regulations are out there being uh, proposed. And you can partner with a vendor who will keep you informed. But you need to start preparing now because it looks like change is coming. While New York is the only one that I'm aware of that has some state regulation in play, it appears that change is going to be coming and more states are going to follow suit. So you need to start preparing now and develop a roadmap. Use that maturity modeling, which again, we're going to cover later, to, to know what your current state is and develop your roadmap and your plan for how you're going to get to um, that future state that you desire. And we got to implement the plan. When the New York regulation was proposed in, in November of 23, it gave hospitals 12 months to be compliant. Now, in my experience, I was uh, used to a calendar fiscal year and budgets were already completed and approved most times by November. Can you imagine uh, all this regulation coming out, you not being aware of it and not having it in budget? So it's gonna put some organizations in a very difficult um, spot if they're not planning ahead. Now, interesting enough, uh, we asked a question to chat GPT, and I assure you I created the PowerPoint before we asked this, but it's very similar responses to what you just heard. And what we asked was, what unique insight would you give healthcare IT leaders about cybersecurity if you were to be direct and honest, stripping away formalities? What's the future hold? Chat GPT said, invest now or you're gonna pay letter. 
cybersecurity is going to cost much more in the long run if you don't go ahead and start addressing it. Don't worry about perfection. Focus on resilience. No matter how much cybersecurity you put in play, you've got to be able to detect and respond and even recover. Train, train, and train some more. Get real about risk assessments. Now, maturity modeling, we talked about maturity modeling being a better approach, and we'll look at HHS's, HHS's response on that. But making sure you're getting something out of your risk assessments. And then be prepared for the unthinkable. According to Chat GPT, the future likely will bring a catastrophic cybersecurity incident in healthcare that impacts patient safety on a large scale. That's difficult to think about but we do need to think about it. We need to be prepared. We have some additional resources if you want to know more. Uh, we actually have a couple of webinars that we've done and, and you can reach out to customers first at gocloudwave.com. The first one is the HHS cybersecurity performance goals that digs deeper into that. And then we have the New York uh, cybersecurity regulation. Now what you've all been waiting for, the cybersecurity capability maturity model. Now we're going to be looking specifically at a C2M2. That's what it stands for is the cybersecurity capability maturity model. There are a couple of others that are out there. They're a lot more difficult. One of them is actually a certification for uh, capability maturity modeling. So C2M2, that's what I'm going to refer to it from here on out, is a way to assess cybersecurity maturity and uncover your gaps. And this was actually created by the Department of Energy as a way to rapidly assess cybersecurity maturity in critical infrastructure. Now the HHS um, actually has a capability maturity model briefing that they did. And the statements that were in that briefing were cybersecurity models are to attempt to collect the best cybersecurity practices. They're developed from a collaboration of experts with different backgrounds who consider, you know, the size of the knowledge, skills, abilities, and experience of different organizations that may use the model. And it's really moving away from that one time a year checkbox exercise to a continuous improvement approach. Um, and, and they say that the way uh, maturity modeling is going to help organizations is by providing uh, business continuity, essentially, or protecting proprietary information or being compliant with laws and regulations. There's a section in the briefing specific to healthcare sector and why you should use maturity modeling, but it really reflects and repeats it, uh, what the uh, organizations will benefit from above. So one of the questions we got in part one of this series was, how is a risk assessment different from maturity modeling? Traditional risk assessments are really overwhelming. When you get them back, there are a lot of findings, a lot of things inside of that, and it's very difficult to prioritize. And it's almost impossible to create alignment. It's not easy to understand that assessment. Usually it takes a technical background. Timelines may not meet. Um, it takes months sometimes to complete this. I, I know it took, uh, in some cases, three to four months to complete an assessment. And again, it's highly technical. And there's no real ROI. Um, it just becomes a check, box that, check the box exercise in most cases. And it really should be the foundation of your um, cyber strategy. But when we look at maturity modeling, it helps you achieve that boardroom to basement alignment. It gives you actionable findings and recommendations. You create a strategy and you can set your budget off of it. And it helps you identify that current state as quickly as possible. In fact, you can actually get results within weeks. You're gonna know your results rapidly and it's gonna integrate with your current security efforts. It's gonna support your compliance and regulatory requirements. And here's a, here's a big part that it's gonna increase your defensibility while decreasing your liability. There are 10 domains in the C2M2 um, maturity model. And these are things like risk management, situational awareness, and workforce management. Now, all of these domains have different um, 
sections inside of them that get rated for the maturity as we see here. So you've got a maturity indicator level. Now this goes back to where we were talking about uh, the maturity levels before where you've got anything from not performed to managed. And as you look across the bottom, these are the domains for the C2M2. And as you can see, each cell in this matrix represents a different domain maturity level. Now, I'm going to show you um, CloudWave C2M2 um, and explain it. And if you look on the left-hand side, the maturity level that we looked at earlier, if you look at the bottom of the donut chart there, you can see where they're represented by colors with green being fully implemented to dark red of being not implemented. Now, if you look at the donut chart inside of the circles, you'll see things like a two for REM and a six for ACM. That's how many measures are inside of that. And as you can see, um, on the left-hand side, the MIL is the maturity indicator level. So there are three maturity indicator levels for the C2M2. Um, so at the bottom is going to be really some of your basic. When we go back to look at the basic goals, a lot of those are going to file in your MIL1 or maybe your MIL2. And then when you look at the advanced goals, the HPH um, advanced goals, they're going to fall more into the MIL3. But when we talk about board debasement alignment and you look at this, this is, this is one of the documents you get from a maturity model. And as you can see, you can quickly look at this and tell, we need to put some focus on EDM. Now, EDM is going to be um, your uh, supply chain and external uh, dep dependencies management. So that's your supply chain. So it's the third from the right, the EDM, and you can see that you've got one dark red and one light red. But if you look above that, you've got a lot more red. Now, the number in the center, I said, is the total measures. And then you've got your color with a number in it that represents how many you are fully implemented versus uh, partially implemented or not implemented. But if you glance at this donut chart, you can easily see where you need to focus. You also can see where you're doing extremely well. So your workforce management just to the right of EDM is doing really well. Look at all the green there. So this is a very quick indicator. This is where we're talking about how it's much simpler to see what your results are and where you need to focus. And as you're starting to set your budget, you know where you need to focus those funds. Now on, um, talk about board uh, basement alignment. Again, this is the cloud wave. Uh, these are some of the outputs that you get from capability maturity modeling. So there's a board briefing that comes out of that. You've got your IT security roadmap. You've got detailed uh, evaluation results. So the, the donut chart is gonna be a simplistic, uh, quick way to look at where you're at. And I said it was continuous monitoring. So as you go in and make changes and implement different controls and improve things, you can quickly make changes inside of the uh, the web portal, and it's going to reflect in your donut charts. So you can track how you're performing and what your maturity is doing across the way. So in conclusion, we talked about a holistic cybersecurity approach. We talked about how we need to involve the whole, whole organization, how it goes beyond the IT department. We also talked about the importance of the organization-wide security. We talked about some potential regulations and the need to prepare, and really the need to go ahead and start implementing. And then lastly, we talked about maturity modeling a little more, uncovering gaps and how maturity modeling is really gonna be a better way uh, to set your roadmap and, and develop your security program uh, than a traditional risk assessment. Now I want to reflect back to the questions we asked earlier, and I want to I want you to look back at some of the uh, responses that you wrote down. So the first question was, does your organization have a holistic cybersecurity approach? And now that you know what we mean by a holistic cybersecurity approach, do you feel like your organization is doing that? Next, are you aware of any current state regulations or federal guidelines that could impact your organization? Now. Hopefully the answer to this one is yes now. Um, so on the next one, who should be responsible for cybersecurity in your organization? Now we asked who was currently responsible 
but who should be responsible? Is it really an IT department or should it be the organization? Should your clinical teams know how to respond to an incident? And lastly, do you feel like there's any gaps in your organization's cybersecurity program? And do you truly know if there's gaps? Do your risk assessments, if you're not doing maturity modeling, are they truly giving you an indication of where there may be gaps? An analyst, they're reporting to another senior 